scaredy squirrel never leaves his nut tree. He'd rather stay in a safe and familiar tree than risk venturing out into the unknown. The unknown can be a scary place for a squirrel. The unknown. A few things scaredy squirrel is afraid of. Tarantulas, poison ivy, green martians, killer bees, germs, and sharks. So he's perfectly happy to stay right where he is. Advantages of never leaving a nut tree, great view, plenty of nuts, safe place, and no tarantulas, poison ivy, green martians, killer bees, germs, and sharks. Disadvantages of never leaving the nut tree, same old view, same old nuts, same old place. In Scaredy Squirrel's nut tree, every day is the same. Everything is predictable. All is under control. On Monday, Scaredy Squirrel's in the tree. Tuesday, still in the tree. Wednesday, you guessed it, in the tree. Thursday, oh, he's in a different part of the tree. Friday, ah, he went to the top. Saturday, just hanging down here in the tree. And Sunday, back up there in the tree. Scaredy Squirrel's daily routine. At 6.45 a.m., he wakes up. At 7 a.m., he eats a nut. 7.15 a.m., look at you. At 12 o'clock noon, he eats a nut. At 12.30 p.m., look at the view. At 5 o'clock p.m., eat a nut. At 5.31 p.m., look at view. And at 8 o'clock p.m., go to sleep. But let's say, just for example, that something unexpected did happen. You can rest assured that this squirrel is prepared. A few items in Scaredy Squirrel's emergency kit, a parachute, bug spray, mask and rubber gloves, a hard hat, antibacterial soap, calamine lotion, net, band-aid, and sardines. And what to do in a case of emergency, according to Scaredy Squirrel, Step one, panic. Step two, run. Step three, get kit. Step four, put on kit. Step five, consult exit plan. And step six, exit tree. If there's absolutely, definitely, truly no other option. This is the to exit plan, top secret. Exit one, note to self, watch out for green Martians and killer bees in the sky. Exit two, note to self. Do not land in river. If unavoidable, use sardines to distract sharks. Exit three, note to self, look out for poison ivy and for tarantulas roaming the ground. And exit four, note to self, keep in mind that germs are everywhere. Remember, if all else fails, playing dead is always a good option. With this emergency kit in hand, Scaredy Squirrel watches. Day after day, he watches. Until one day, Thursday, 9.37 a.m. A killer bee appears! Scaredy Squirrel jumps in a panic, knocking his emergency kit out of the tree. This was not part of the plan. Scaredy Squirrel jumps to catch his kit. He quickly regrets his idea. The parachute is in the kit. But something incredible happens. He starts to glide, and Scaredy Squirrel is no ordinary squirrel. He's a flying squirrel. Scaredy Squirrel forgets all about the killer bee, not to mention the tarantulas, poison ivy, green martians, germs, and sharks. He feels overjoyed, adventurous, carefree, alive, until he lands in a bush and plays dead. 30 minutes later, <laughs> one hour later, two hours later. Finally, Scaredy Squirrels realize that nothing horrible is happening in the unknown today. So, he returns to his nut tree. 
All this excitement was inspired Scaredy Squirrel to make drastic changes to his life. Scaredy Squirrel's new and improved daily routine. At 6.45 a.m., wake up. 7 o'clock a.m., eat a nut. 7.15 a.m., look at view. 9.37 a.m., jump into the unknown. At 9.45 a.m., play dead. 11.45 a.m., return home. <laughs> return home. <laughs> at 12 o'clock noon, eat a nut. At 12.30 p.m., look at view. 5 o'clock p.m., eat a nut. 5.31 p.m., look at view. And 8 o'clock p.m., go to sleep. P.S. As for the emergency kit, Scratchy Squirrel is in no hurry to pick it up. Just yet. The end. One day in class, Duncan went to take out his crayons and found a stack of letters with his name on them. <laughs> hey Duncan, it's me, Red Crayon. We need to talk. You make me work harder than any of your other crayons. All year long, I wear myself out coloring fire engines, apples, strawberries, and everything else that's red. I even work on holidays. I have to color all the Santas at Christmas and all the hearts on Valentine's Day. I need a rest. Your overworked friend, Red Crayon. Dear Duncan, all right, listen. I love that I'm your favorite crayon for grapes, dragons, and wizard hats. But it makes me crazy that so much of my gorgeous color goes outside the lines. If you don't start coloring inside the lines soon, I'm going to completely lose it. Your very neat friend, Purple Crayon. Dear Duncan, I'm tired of being called light brown, or dark tan because I am neither. I am beige and I am proud. I'm also tired of being second place to Mr. Brown Crayon. It's not fair that Brown gets all the bears, ponies, and puppies while the only things that I get are turkey dinners, if I'm lucky. And we, and let's be honest, when was the last time you saw a kid excited about coloring wheat? Your beige friend, beige crayon. Aww. Duncan, gray crayon here. You're killing me. I know you love elephants, and I know the elephants are gray, but that's a lot of space to color and all by myself. And don't even get me started on your rhinos, hippos, and humpback whales. You know how tired I am after handling one of those things. Such big animals, oh buddy. Aww. Baby penguins are gray, you know. So are very tiny rocks, pebbles. How about one of those once in a while to give me a break? You're very tired, friend. Gray crayon. Dear Duncan, you color with me, but why? Most of the time, I'm the same color as the page you are using me on, white. If I didn't have a black outline, you wouldn't even know I was there. I'm not even in the rainbow. I'm only used to color snow or to fill an empty space between other things and it leaves me feeling, well, empty. We need to talk. Your empty friend, white crayon. And white crayon was used to draw the white cat in the snow by Duncan. Hi, Duncan. I hate being used to draw the outline of things things that are colored in by other colors, all of which think they're brighter than me. It's not fair when you use me to draw nice beach balls and then fill in the colors with all the other crayons. How about a black beach ball sometime? Is that too much to ask? Your friend, black crayon. Dear Duncan, as green crayon, I am writing for two reasons. One is to say that I like my workloads of crocodiles, trees, dinosaurs, and frogs. 
I have no problems and wish to congratulate you on a very successful coloring things green career so far. The second reason I write is for my friends, yellow crayon and orange crayon, who are no longer speaking to each other. Both crayons feel they should be the color of the sun. Please settle this soon because they're driving the rest of us crazy. Your happy friend, green crayon. Dear Duncan, yellow crayon here. I need you to tell orange crayon that I am the color of the sun. I would tell him, but we are no longer speaking. And I can prove I'm the color of the sun too. Last Tuesday, you used me to color in the sun on your happy form coloring book. In case you forgot, it's on page seven. You can't miss me. I'm shining down brilliantly on a field of yellow corn. Your pal in the true color of the sun, yellow crayon. <laughs> Dear Duncan, I see yellow crayon already talked to you, the big whiner. Anyway, could you please tell Mr. Tattletail that he is not the color of the sun? I would, but we're no longer speaking. We both know I'm clearly the color of the sun because on Thursday, you used me to color the sun on both the Monkey Island and Meet the Zookeeper pages in your Day at the Zoo coloring book. Or aren't you glad I'm here? Ha <laughs> your pal and the real color of the sun, orange crayon. Dear Duncan, it's been great being your favorite color this past year, and the year before, <laughs> and the year before that. I have really enjoyed all those oceans, lakes, rivers, raindrops, rain clouds, and clear skies. But the bad news is that I'm so short and stubby, I can't even see over the railing in the crayon box anymore. I need a break. Your very stubby friend, Blue Crayon. Duncan, okay, listen here, kid. You have not used me once in the past year. It's because you think I'm a girl's color, isn't it? Speaking of which, please tell your little sister I said thank you for using me to color her in her little princess coloring book. I think she did a fabulous job of staying inside the lines. Now, back to us. Could you please use me sometime to color the occasional dinosaur, monster, or cowboy? Goodness knows they could use a splash of color year unused friend, pink crayon. Hey Duncan, it's me, peach crayon. Why did you peel off my paper wrapping? Now I'm naked and too embarrassed to leave the crayon box. I don't even have any underwear. How would you like to go to school naked? I need some clothes help. Your naked friend, peach crayon. Well, poor Duncan just wanted to color. And of course, he wanted his crayons to be happy. And that gave him an idea. When Duncan showed his teacher his new picture, she gave him an A for coloring. Look at that. Beautiful masterpiece by Duncan using all of his crayons and an A plus for creativity. The end. From the deck of his pirate ship, the Sea Dragon, Captain Craig spied a small blue bottle bobbing among the waves and the sharks. Captain Craig was courageous. He was daring. He was gone. With a flawless dive, he sliced through the water and snagged the cork with his hook. His crew cheered and waved and chanted, Go Crave! and caused quite a commotion, as good pirates should. After taking a bow, Captain Crave uncorked the treasure within. Dearest Clancy, who's my big brave pirate? Mummy so proudly to become a captain of your very own ship. Bravo! Enclosed is a lovely list I found in the Your Best Buccaneer magazine. Isn't it tip top or ship shape or whatever you swashbucklers say? Try to stay away from sharks. Clancy dear, remember, mummy loves you. P.S. Here's a little something for your treasure chest. P.P.S. Don't forget to keep your new hook clean. 
Captain Craig stuffed the letter and the shiny doubloon into his pocket. Me, Mom, he said with a shrug, handing the list to his first mate. Think you're the perfect pirate captain, she read. Use a handy checklist to be sure. Ship? Check, replied the captain. Courage and daring? Double check. Treasure? Check. Eye patch? Check. Hulk? Check it out. Peg leg? On me to do list. Pet? Pet? That's what it says. Well, shut me an oyster and set sail for land. We need to find me a pet. The pirates anchored on a sandy beach. They caused quite a commotion, as good pirates should. They set about at once, scooping and digging. Crab? Too cranky. Octopus? Too clingy. Clam? Too quiet. Drat, said Captain Crave. There'll be no perfect pets on the beach. Onward ho! The pirates marched onward until they came to a farm. They caused quite a commotion, as good pirates should. The crew scurried about, grabbing and hurting. Goat? Too nibbly. Pig? Too muddy. Donkey? Too stubborn. Goose? Too bossy. Drat, said Captain Crave. There'll be no perfect pets on the farm. Onward ho! The pirates marched onward until they came to a zoo. They caused quite a commotion, as good pirates should. The crew began unlocking and unleashing. Elephant? Too big. Koala? Too cuddly. Lion? Yikes! When the uproar finally died down, Captain Craig said, Well, I finally got to meet Peg Leg. Check, scribbled the first mate. Now, if only I could find me a pet. The harried zookeeper stuffed the pirates into a trolley and drove directly to the Pet Emporium. The pirates crowded eagerly into the shop. There were kittens and bunnies, guppies and puppies, all kinds of cute, cuddly creatures. Sure, me shih tzus, Captain Craig exclaimed. There be piles of pets. Just then, there was a squawk from above. The captain looked up. Splat! I've been pooped at, he yelled. The pirates chased the birdie. They raced the birdie. Should we taste the birdie? Give her a air, ordered the captain. He eyed the parrot closely. Huh, he murmured. You're a brave one, I see. I said the parrot. He pooped in the eye. I echoed the parrot, and caused quite a commotion. I agreed the parrot, like a good parrot should. I asked the parrot, and everything would be perfect, the captain mused. If only I could find me a pet. Do you happen to know, a land, sea, a sky, any pirates worthy pets? The parrot stepped onto Captain Craig's shoulder and nibbled his ear. I said the parrot. Onward ho! Captain Crave flipped his shiny doubloon to the shopkeeper as he thumped out the door. The perfect pirate captain with the perfect pirate pet. The end. The sun did not shine. It was too wet to play. So we sat in the house all that cold, cold, wet day. I sat there with Sally, we sat there, we two, and I said, how I wish we had something to do. Too wet to go out and too cold to play ball, so we sat in the house. <laughs> we did nothing at all. So, all we could do was to sit, 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 and sit. And we did not like it, not one little bit. Bump, and then something went bump. How that bump made us jump. We looked, then we saw him step in on the mat. We looked, and we saw him, the cat in the hat. And he said to us, why do you sit there like that? 
I know it is wet and the sun is not sunny, but we can have lots of good fun. That is funny. I know some good games we could play, said the cat. I know some new tricks, said the cat in the hat. A lot of good tricks, and I will show them to you. Your mother will not mind at all if I do. Then Sally and I did not know what to say. Our mother was out of the house for the day. But our fish said, no, no, make that cat go away. Tell that cat in the hat you do not want to play. He should not be here, he should not be about. He should not be here when your mother is out. Now, now, have no fear, have no fear, said the cat. My tricks are not bad, said the cat in the hat. Why? We can have lots of good fun if you wish, with the game that I call Up, Up, Up with the fish. Put me down, said the fish. This is no fun at all. Put me down, said the fish. I do not wish to fall. Have no fear, said the cat. I will not let you fall. I will hold you up high as I stand on a ball, with a book on one hand and a cup on my hat. But that is not all I can do, said the cat. Look at me, look at me now, said the cat. With a cup and a cake on the top of my hat, I can hold up two books, I can hold up the fish, and the little boy, and a little toy ship, and some milk on a dish. And look, I can hop up and down on the ball, and that is not all, oh no, that is not all. Woo. <laughs> Look at me, look at me, look at me now. It is fun to have fun, but you have to know how. I can hold up the cup and the milk and the cake. I can hold up these books and the fish on a rake. I can hold the toy ship and the little toy man. And look, with my tail, I can hold a red fan. I can fan with the fan as I hop on the ball. But that is not all, oh no, that is not all. That is what the cat said. Then he fell on his head. He came down with a bump. From up there on the ball, and Sally and I, we saw all the things fall. And our fish came down too, and he fell into a pot. He said, do I like this? Oh no, I do not. This is not a good game, said our fish as he lit. No, I do not like it, not one little bit. No, look what you did, said the fish to the cat. No, look at this house, look at this, look at that. You sank our toy ship, sank it deep in the cake. You shook up our house and you bent our new rake. You should not be here when our mother is not. You should get out of this house, said the fish in the pot. But I like to be here, oh I like it a lot, said the cat in the hat. To the fish in the pot, I will not go away, I do not wish to go. And so, said the cat in the hat, so, 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 I will show you another good name, game that I know. And then he ran out. And then fast as a fox, the cat in the hat came back with the box. A big red wood box. It was shut with the hook. Now look at this trick, said the cat. Take a look. Then he got up on top with the tip of his hat. I call this game fun in a box, said the cat. And this box are two things I will show to you now. You will like these two things, said the cat with the bow. I will pick up the hook, you will see something new. Two things, and I call them thing one and thing two. These things will not bite you, they want to have fun. Then out of the box came thing two and thing one. They ran to us fast, they said, how do you do? Would you like to shake hands with thing one and thing two? And Sally and I did not know what to do, so we had to shake hands with thing one and thing two. We shook their two hands, but our fish said, no, no. Those things should not be in this house, make them go. They should not be here when your mother is not. Put them out, put them out, said the fish in the pot. Have no fear, little fish, said the cat in the hat. These things are good things, and he gave them a pat. They are tame, oh so tame. They have come here to play. They will give you some fun on this wet, wet day. Now here's a game that they like, said the cat. They like to fly kites, said the cat in the hat. No, not in this house, said the fish in the pot. They should not fly kites in the house, they should not. Oh, the things that they will bump, all the things they will hit. Oh, I do not like it, not one little bit. Then Sally and I saw them run down the hall. We saw those two things bump their kites on the wall. Bump, thump, thump, bump, down the wall, in the hall. 
Thing two and thing one, they ran up, they ran down. On the string of one kite, we saw mother's new gown. Her gown with the dots that are pink, white, and red. Then we saw one kite bump on the head of her bed. Then, those things ran about with big bumps, jumps, and kicks, and with hops and big thumps and all kinds of bad tricks. And I said, I do not like the way that they play. Mother could see this, so what would she say? Then, our fish said, look, look, and our fish shook with fear. Your mother is on her way home, do you hear? Oh, what will she do to us? What will she say? Oh, she will not like it to find us this way. So, do something fast, said the fish, do you hear? I saw her, your mother, your mother is near. So as fast as you can, think of something to do. You'll have to get rid of thing one and thing two. So, as fast as I could, I went after my net. And I said, with my net, I can get them, I bet. I bet with my net, I can get those things yet. Then, I let down my net, it came down with a plop. And I had them at last, those two things had to stop. Then I said to the cat, now you do as I say, you pack up those things and you take them away. Oh dear, said the cat, you did not like your game. Oh dear, what a shame, what a shame, what a shame. Then he shot the things in the box with the hook and the cat went away with a sad kind of look. This is good, said the fish, he has gone away, yes. But your mother will come and she will find this big mess. This mess is so big and so deep and so tall we cannot pick it up. There is no way at all. And then, who was back in the house? Why the cat? Have no fear of this mess, said the cat in the hat. I always pick up all my playthings. And so, I will show you another good trick that I know. Then, we saw him pick up all the things that were down. He picked up the cake and the rake and the gown and the milk and the strings and the books and the dish and the fan and the cup and the ship and the fish. And he put them away. Then he said, that is that. And then he was gone with the tip of his hat. Then our mother came in and she said to us too, did you have any fun? Tell me, what did you do? And Sally and I did not know what to say. Should we tell her the things that went on there that day? Should we tell her about it? Now, what should we do? Well, what would you do if your mother asked you? <laughs> the end. Long, long ago, when the world was young and everything was new, a mother dinosaur sat proudly on her eggs. One by one, the eggs began to crack and baby dinosaurs poked their heads out into the sunshine, all except one. The mother worried and fussed about it and kept it warm and sang songs to it, but still the egg didn't crack. The neighbors came by with help and advice. Make it warmer, they said. Keep it cool, they suggested. The mother was very loving and lay beside the egg all the time. She breathed on it to keep it warm and fanned it with a banana leaves to cool it down. But still, the egg didn't crack. The father dinosaur wanted to break the egg open, but the mother said, no, it will happen when the baby is ready, not before. One day, the father became so tired of looking after all the other young dinosaurs while the mother fussed over the egg that he put his face very close to the egg and shouted, Come on, egg, do something. The egg shook, the egg wobbled, and then it began to crack. A little crack at first, then a big crack, and a shell broke in two. The baby dinosaur blinked in the sunlight. The father dinosaur gasped, the mother dinosaur gasped, all the young dinosaurs and all the neighbors gasped. They had never seen such a tiny baby. That's the littlest dinosaur I've ever seen, said the father. He's no bigger than a dinosaur's toe. The neighbors began to giggle. Oh, he may be tiny, but he's very special to me, cried the mother dinosaur, and she scooped up the baby and kissed his tiny face. Days and weeks passed, and no matter how much food the mother dinosaur gave the baby, he didn't grow any bigger. 
The littlest dinosaur was sad because he was too small to join his big brothers and sisters when they played. And what if one of his huge neighbors stepped on him by accident? The only place the littlest dinosaur felt safe was high on a hill. There, he could sit and look down on the forest. It made him feel bigger. One day, far away on another hill, he saw another dinosaur. It was a long neck. Even at that distance, he looked sad. The littlest dinosaur wondered how a dinosaur that big could possibly be sad. When the rainy season began, the big dinosaur squelched and rolled in the mud. But not the littlest dinosaur. He hated the mud. He was always getting stuck in the other dinosaur's big, muddy footprints and having to yell, Help! Get me out of here! One day, the father dinosaur got stuck. He was squelching and rolling in deep in the mud in the edge of the river. But when he tried to get out, he couldn't. The more he struggled, the more he got stuck. Get me out of here, he yelled. The mother tried to help, but she got stuck. The neighbors tried to help, and they got stuck. The littlest dinosaur's brothers and sisters waited in, and they got stuck too. Get us out of here, they yelled. The littlest dinosaur wished and wished that he were big enough to rescue them. You have to go for help, said another dinosaur. But who could help? the littlest dinosaur. Then, he remembered the long neck. The littlest dinosaur was scared as he stepped from the riverbank onto a water lily leaf. It tipped and dipped, but it didn't sink. One leaf, one leaf at a time, he wibbled and wobbled his way across the river, then ran through the forest and climbed the hill, slipping and sliding, sliding and slipping, until he got to the top. There he was, the long neck. He looked down at the littlest dinosaur. Help me, Cree! Help me, please! The littlest dinosaur cried. My family is stuck in the river and the water is rising fast. The long neck picked him up and with great long strides was soon down the hill through the forest and at the river bank. He stretched his neck across the river and began pulling out the sinking dinosaurs until one by one they were all safe on the shore. Thank you, the father dinosaur shouted as he waved the long neck. And as for you, he said, picking up the littlest dinosaur, you may be the size of a bug, but you're as brave as a dinosaur 100 times your size. And he kissed him on his tiny nose. When the rain stopped and the river was not so wide, the littlest dinosaur went to visit the long neck again. He no longer looked so sad. I thought I was too big and clumsy to do anything useful, he said. But now I know that's not true. And I thought I was too small to do anything at all, laughed the littlest dinosaur. They sat together on the hill, the biggest and the littlest, and now the greatest of friends. The end. Pete the Cat was walking down the street in his brand new white shoes. Pete loved his white shoes so much, he sang this song. I love my white shoes, I love my white shoes, I love my white shoes. Oh no! Pete stepped in a large pile of strawberries. What color did it turn his shoes? Red. Did Pete cry? Goodness no! He kept walking along and singing his song. Everything is cool. I love my red shoes. I love my red shoes. I love my red shoes. <laughs> oh no! Pete stepped in a large pile of blueberries. What color did it turn his shoes? Blue! Did Pete cry? Goodness no. He kept walking along and singing his song. Awesome. I love my blue shoes. I love my blue shoes. I love my blue shoes. Oh no! 
Pete stepped in a large puddle of mud. What color did it turn his shoes? Brown. Did Pete cry? Goodness, no. He kept walking along and singing his song. Groovy. I love my brown shoes. I love my brown shoes. I love my brown shoes. Oh no! Pete stepped in a bucket of water. And all the brown and all the blue and all the red were washed away. What color were her shoes again? White. <laughs> but now they were wet. But did Pete cry? Goodness, no. He kept walking along and singing his song, rock and roll. I love my wet shoes. I love my wet shoes. I love my wet shoes. <laughs> the moral of Pete's story is, no matter what you step in, keep walking along and singing your song. Because it's all good. The end. I dreamed of you, then you appeared. Together we became amor, love, amor. Resplendent life, you and I. One day, we bundled gifts in our backpack and crossed a bridge outstretched like the universe. And when we made it to the other side, thirsty and all, unable to go back, we became immigrants. Migrantes, you and I, the sky and the land welcomed us in the words unlike those of our ancestors. There were so many things we didn't know, unable to understand and afraid to speak. We made lots of mistakes. You and I became caminantes. Thousands and thousands of steps we took around this land until the day we found a place we had never seen before. Suspicious, improbable, unbelievable, surprising, unimaginable. Where we didn't need to speak, we only needed to trust, and we did. Books became our language. Books became our home. Books became our lives. We learned to read, to speak, to write, and to make our voices heard. Someday, we would become something we haven't yet imagined. But right now, we are stories, we are two languages, we are lucha, we are resilience, we are hope, we are dreamers, soñadores of the world. We are love, amor, love. The end. Early one morning, the wind blew a spider across the field. A thin, silky thread trailed from her body. The spider landed on a fence post near a farmyard and began to spin a web with her silky thread. Nay, nay, said the horse. Want to go for a ride? The spider didn't answer. She was very busy spinning her web. Moo, moo, said the cow. Want to eat some grass? The spider didn't answer. She was very busy spinning her web. Ba, ba, bleated the sheep. Want to run in the meadow? The spider didn't answer. She was very busy spinning her web. Ba, ba, said the goat. Want to jump on the rats? The spider didn't answer. She was very busy spinning her web. Oink, oink, grunted the pig. Want to roll in the mud? The spider didn't answer. She was very busy spinning her web. Hey, get 
to see you. Glad you could join us. Woof! Woof! Bark the dog. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. Want to chase a cat? The spider didn't answer. She was very busy spinning her web. Cried the cat. Want to take a nap? The spider didn't answer. She was very busy spinning her web. Quack quack! Called the duck. Want to go for a swim? The spider didn't answer. She had now finished her web. Cock a doodle doo! <laughs> Sorry, we saw you there, scare you. Want to catch a pesky fly? And the spider caught the fly in her web, just like that. Who, who? asked the owl. Who built this beautiful web? The spider didn't answer. She had fallen asleep. It had been a very, very busy day. The end. Once there was a poor miller who had a beautiful daughter. On his way to town one day, the miller encountered the king. Wanting to impress him, the miller said, I have a daughter who knows the artist from straw into gold. Now, the king had a passion for gold and such an art intrigued him. So he ordered the miller to send his daughter to the castle straight away. When the girl was brought before him, the king led her to a room that was filled with straw. He gave her spools and a spinning wheel and said, You may spin all night, but if you have not spun the straw into gold by morning, you will have to die. With that, he locked the door and the girl was left inside, alone. There sat the poor miller's daughter without the slightest idea how anyone could spin straw into gold. For the life of her, she did not know what to do. She grew more and more frightened, and then she began to weep. Suddenly, the door sprang open and a tiny man stepped in. Good evening, Mistress Miller, he said. Why are you sobbing? Oh, the girl cried. I must spin this straw to gold and I don't know how. What will you give me if I spin it for you? The little man asked. My necklace, answered the girl. The little man took her necklace and sat down at the spinning wheel. He pulled three times, whirr, 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 and the spool was wound full of gold thread. He fitted another spool on and whirr, whirr, whirr. Three pulls and that one too was full. And so it went until morning when all the straw was spun and all the spools were full of gold. When the king came at sunrise, he was amazed and delighted, but all the gold only made him grievier. So he led the miller's daughter to a larger room filled with straw, and he ordered her to spin this straw too before dawn, if she valued her life. The girl did not know what to do. She began to weep. Once more, the door opened and the little man stepped in. What will you give me if I spin this straw into gold for you? He asked. The ring on my finger, answered the girl, and the little man took her ring. Then he set the spinning wheel whirring, and before the night was over, he had spun all the straw into gleaming gold. Shortly after sunrise, the king returned. Piles of golden spools glowed in the morning light. The king rejoiced at the sight of so much gold, but still he was not satisfied. He led the miller's daughter to a third, even bigger room that was piled high with straw. Tonight, you must spin the straw too, ordered the king. And if you succeed, you shall become my wife. Because he thought, I could not find a richer wife in all the world. When the king had left, the little man appeared for the third time. What will you give me if I spin for you yet once more? He asked. I have nothing else, the girl replied. Then prompts that when you become queen, your first child will belong 
to me. The miller's daughter gasped. How could she promise such a thing? Then she thought, but who knows whether that will ever happen. And as she could think of no other way to save herself, she promised. And the little man once again spent all the straw into gold. When the king came in the morning and found everything as he had wished, he married the miller's beautiful daughter and she became a queen. A year passed and the queen brought a handsome baby boy into the world. She gave scarcely a thought to the little man, but one day he appeared suddenly in her room. Now give me what you promised me, he demanded. The queen pleaded with the little man. He could take all the royal treasure if he would only let her keep her child. But her pleading was in vain. Then she began to weep so piteously that at last the little man was moved. I will give you three days, he said. If by the end of that time you know my name, you may keep your child. Long into the night the queen sat and through the next day, thinking over all the names she had ever heard. That evening the little man returned. Beginning with Caspar, Melchior, and Balthasar, the queen recited every name she knew, one after another. But to each one the little man replied, that is not my name. The second day, the queen had inquiries made in town, searching for new names. And when the little man came that evening, she posed the strangest and most unusual ones to him. She tried beastie ribs and lego ram and string bones, but he would only reply, that is not my name. Now the queen grew truly frightened and she sent her most faithful servant to the woods to look for the little man. The servant searched her thickets and over clearings deep into the forest. At last, near the top of a hill, she spied him. He was right on a cooking spoon around a great fire and crying out, I brew my beer, I bake my loaves, and soon the queen's own son I'll claim. Oh, lucky me, for no one knows that Rumpelstiltskin is my name. The servant made her way back as fast as she could manage, and at midday reached the castle. You can imagine how glad the queen was when she heard the name. Late that evening, the little man arrived. Now, Mrs. Queen, he said, do you know my name, or do I take the child? So the queen asked him, is your name Will? No. Is your name Bill? No. In that case, is your name Rumpelstiltskin? The devil told you that! The devil told you that! shrieked Rumpelstiltskin. And in a fury, he jumped on his cooking spoon and blew out the window. And he never was heard from again. The Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Everyone knows the story of Humpty Dumpty. Not so many know the story of his little sister, Dimity. Now her story can be told. Dimity Dumpty was born by the roadside she cried a small note in perfect tune with a blackbird singing outside her window. It's a girl, cried her mom and dad, overjoyed. Humpty did a cartwheel and two double twists. The Dumpty family was part of a traveling circus. Along many roads they bumped, down icy winter highways and up summer country lanes from town to town. As he grew, Humpty turned into something of a rascal. Sit down, Humpty, his mom often said to him. One of these days, you'll take a tumble. Dimity grew too. Unlike her brother, she was shy and timid as a field mouse. Her small voice lost itself in the noise of the wheels and the dust of the road. But it was in the dust of the road that a gift lay waiting for her one day. It was Dimity's father, Dominic, who found the old pen. He removed the case and, from the tube inside, made his daughter a little silver flute. Dimity's first notes were soft as the breeze.
breeze itself. There was always much to do when the circus came to town. The hen to be fed and watered, ropes to be pulled, stakes to be hammered in, and the big top to go up. And there were shows to be performed. Dimity watched as her family applied makeup, dusted their hands, and became the Tumbling Dumpties. Won't you join us, honey? asked her mom, Dorothy, before each show. Every time, Dimity shook her head. No, thank you, she replied. At showtime, the Tumbling Dumpties brought the circus crowd to its feet with breathtaking displays of daring. The great Dominic Dumpty threw his son, Humpty, high in the air. Humpty turned end over end, the circus lights glinting in his fragile shell. Then, Dorothy and Dominic Dumpty flew from the trapeze high above the circus ring. To Dimity, in the shadows below, her mother looked beautiful, transformed like a butterfly. But as the crowd roared in, the spotlight pushed like a bright finger across the tent. She looked for a quieter place. Up above the circus ground, she blew into her silver flute, soft as a snail on a cabbage leaf, quiet as the grass growing on the hill, gentle as a beetle's breath making sounds known only to birds and things that slide in the night. No spotlight had ever caught Dimity in its bright glare. One hot summer day, when Humpty's turn was over and their parents were still spinning and tumbling in the top of the tent, Humpty and Dimity opened the roof of the camper. Dimity's fingers found a cool little tune on her flute. Humpty's fingers found his mom's lipstick. That's not too clever, Humpty, gasped Dimity when she saw what he was doing. To write your name on your own wall? When their parents returned from the spotlight, moisture still drying on their hot shelves, Dominic's foot tapped and Dorothy's finger quivered. Clean it off right now, Humpty, said his mom, or trouble will come knocking at your door. And trouble did come calling the following afternoon when Humpty, once more with time on his hands, found a can of spray paint by the old factory wall. Yes, trouble arrived along with the storm clouds brewing over the town. Humpty climbed onto the wall, sprayed his name, and slipped. Passing soldiers and the horses were no help at all. It's only an egg, said one soldier to another, and they returned to the barracks. Only an egg? Only an egg? This egg, however naughty was spray paint, was someone's brother. That Humpty had a great fall is known well enough. What is not known is the courage of his little sister. Far away on the other side of the circus, Dimity heard a tremor in the wind and felt a flutter right down deep in her little shell. She picked up her skirts and ran. Dimity stopped. Her hands went to her face. She took a deep breath, then removed her t-shirt and bandaged Humpty's leakage. She laid her little flute along Humpty's leg and wrapped her skirt around it. She tried to stop passerby. Please help my brother, she called, but nobody heard her. There was only one thing to do. Once more, she ran. Dimity reached the tent, slowly lifted the flap, and found her voice. My brother has taken a tumble and needs help. In the hospital, Humpty received lots of visitors and lots of chocolates. Even the soldiers came when they heard it on the radio. We are sorry, Humpty, the captain said. What can we do to make up for this? How about a ride on your horse when I get out? Asked Humpty at once. A big cheer for Dimity and as many of her brother's chocolates as she can eat, said a clown. Somewhere down behind her mother's skirts, Dimity blushed. Dimity is still shy and timid as a field mouse. She has never returned to the spotlight nor join the tumbling dumpties, but she has changed. And there has been a change around the circus too. In the mornings, when the bright lights from the last night's show are only a memory, 
Demi's silver flute can be heard in the sunlight in the shadows of the circus grounds. The music slips under doorways, through skylights and windows, as surely and pleasantly as the smell of hot chocolate. The high notes fly like swifts on a summer's morning and the low notes whisper like wind in the pine trees. But Demi's tunes can still be heard right across the circus ground. They sparkle like the sun on the water. It's the music of the heavens, says the ringmaster. Let the tent come down, but all in good time. Only when she can play no more does the tent come down until the next stop and the next show somewhere down the road. As for Humpty, he made a full recovery and has put away his spray paint. He now flies on the trapeze with the tumbling dumpties and he rides the captain's horse in an act of his own. The end. Daisy wasn't always dizzy, but Daisy loves the merry-go-round, and today she wanted to go twice as fast as usual. When the merry-go-round finally stopped, Daisy didn't. She was dizzy. She was so dizzy, when she started home, she began to fly sideways. Dizzy, dizzy from spinning today, I need help for my friends to find my way. While flying sideways, Daisy ran into Lenny the lizard on the side of the lamppost. Lenny smiled and told Daisy she was going the wrong way home. Daisy turned around, but she was still dizzy. She began to fly upside down. Dizzy, dizzy from Spain today, I need help for my friends to find my way. While flying upside down, Daisy ran to Polly the possum hanging in a pear tree. Polly smiled and told Daisy she was going the wrong way home. Daisy turned around, but she was still dizzy. She began to fly sideways again. Dizzy, dizzy from Spain today, I need help for my friends to find my way. While flying sideways, Daisy ran into Benny the Beetle on the side of a bench. Benny smiled and told Daisy she was going the wrong way home. Daisy turned around and this time she wasn't dizzy anymore. She started to fly right side up. Daisy was right around the corner from her home. And she flew straight there and shared with her mom. I played a merry-go-round and went for a spin. I can't wait till tomorrow to do it again. The end. On this bright and shiny morning, I want something fun to do. So I'm riding on a rainbow and I'm heading to the zoo. The kids think they have spotted me. I thought I'd blend in here. I cannot let them catch me or my magic will disappear. Is that a unicorn? I think they can fly. I believe they fart glitter. I heard they can shrink. Let's catch it. Luckily, my animal friends from the zebra to the ape are all on board to help me. They will make sure I escape. First, I see my stripy cousins, but then I have to fly. As much as I like lemonade, I have to say goodbye. I dodge a plastic parachute being launched from down below. I do a spin and leave a trail of glitter as I go. I chill with all my penguin pals, but these traps are everywhere. I'll head to the nocturnal house. I hope it's safe in there. 
Wow, this room is super dark. I'm glad I'm a unicorn. Who knows what I might walk into without my magic horn. Now, I'm off to see more friends. It's time to shrink my size, but it sure is hard to see in here with all these butterflies. My nose smells something super sweet coming from the cafe. Oh yum, I snag a little bite before I fly away. <laughs> Next, I go to where it's hot and where there's lots of scales. The snakes and lizards help me though with their clever use of tails. I'm big again with more friends. These monkeys make me laugh, but I would have been caught easily if not for the giraffe. What's over there? A paddle boat? This could be lots of fun. I would stay in the water, but my friends are roaring run! While visiting my beaver friends, I spy a welcome sight. My true friends come to save the day with their bold, brave beaver bite. The gift shop makes the perfect place for your elaborate trap. But lucky for me, there's a decoy for to safely take the wrap. I had fun with my friends today. The zoo has been a blast. You tried your best, your traps were smart, but unicorns are fast. Now it's time for me to go and maybe take a nap. Meanwhile, keep on trying, kids. I'll be back to best your trap. Better luck next time. The end. Once upon a time, there was a little old sensei who taught ninjas in a hidden dojo. The group trained hard to be the strongest, fastest, smartest, and sneakiest ninjas in all the land. Sensei was very proud of his students. So proud that one night he made him a special treat, ninja bread. Ninja bread was an age old recipe passed down from sensei to sensei. It took a lifetime to master. Once baked, the cookies contained many mysterious powers. They were also dangerously delicious. Sensei mixed the batter, rolled the dough, and shaped the ninja bread into a tiny sword and throwing stars. Then, Sensei crafted a ninja bread man. Once done, he carefully placed the tray in the oven. Finally, the Sensei opened the do oven door to check on the ninja bread. Out leap the ninja bread man, alive and kicking. Sensei was surprised to hear the cookie speak. The time has come to test your students. Now they must try, try as best as they can. They can't beat me, I'm the ninja bread man. With a crack and a flash, the ninja bread man disappeared in a cloud of sugar dust. Sensei sounded the gong as a warning to his ninjas. Tonight, they face the greatest challenge of their lives. Ninja Bear was balancing on one finger when he heard the gong. Suddenly, a sweet scent filled the night air. Danger was near. With a crack and a flash, a cookie figure stood before him and announced, Try, try as best as you can. You can't beat me. I'm the Ninja Brad Man. I got past Sensei. Escaped in the night, and I'll defeat you too. I can, I can. Ninja bread man, shot a ninja bear. You will make a mighty morsel. With a running roar, ninja bear charged. But the ninja bread man jumped out of the way, and ninja bear lost his balance. Then, with a bow, with a bow the ninja bread man escaped into the night. Come back, yelled ninja bear, but the cookie had disappeared. Ninja Snake was throwing stars in the forest when she sent Sensei's warning. The bamboo swayed in the wind. Danger was near. 
Suddenly, a hooky figure stood before her and announced, Try, try as best as you can. You can't beat me. I'm the Ninja Bread Man. I got past Sensei, escaped in the night. I dodged Ninja Bear in the pale moonlight. And I'll defeat you too. I can, I can. Ninja Bread Man, hiss Ninja Snake. You will make a super snack. With the flick, flick, swish, Ninja Snake launched her throwing stars. But the Ninja Bread Man was too fast. He launched a cookie star ninja attack of his own. Then with the bow, the Ninja Bread Man escaped into the night. Come back, yelled Ninja Snake. But the cookie had disappeared. Ninja Mouse was training with the sword when the warning gong rang. Ninja Mouse heard someone tiptoeing around. Danger was near. In the blink of an eye, a cookie figure stood before him and announced, Try, try, as best as you can. You can't beat me, I'm the Ninja Bread Man. I got past Sensei, escaped in the night. I dodged Ninja Bear in the pale moonlight. I slipped past Ninja Snake in the throwing star fight. And I'll defeat you too, I can, I can. Ninja Bread Man, squeaked Ninja Mouse, you will make a nice nibble. Ninja Mouse sprang forward, but the Ninja Bread Man tricked the Mighty Mouse. Then with a bow, the Ninja Bread Man escaped into the night. Come back, yelled Ninja Mouse, but the cookie had disappeared. Ninja Fox was sitting beside the Great Waterfall. He did not hear Sensei's warning. Hmm, Ninja Fox gently hummed. I sense something dangerously delicious. With a crack and a flash, a cookie figure stood before him and announced, Try, try, as best as you can. You can't beat me. I'm the Ninja Bread Man. I got past inside, escaped in the night. I dodged Ninja Bear in the pale moonlight. I slipped past Ninja Snake and made Ninja Mouse ache. And I'll outfox you too. I can, I can. I'm sorry, said Ninja Fox. I didn't hear you. What did you say? The Ninja Bread Man stepped closer and repeated. Try, try, as best as you can. You can beat me. I'm the Ninja Bread Man. I got past Sensei, escaped in the night. I dodged Ninja Bear in the pale moonlight. I slipped past Ninja Skate. Snake and made Ninja Mouse ache, and I'll outbox you. I can, I can. I'm so sorry, said Ninja Fox, pretending he could not hear the cookie. The waterfall is so loud. <laughs> what did you say? The Ninja Bread Man took one final step closer. Following me in one quick movement, a cloud of sugar dust covered Ninja Fox. Ninja Bear, Ninja Snake, and Ninja Mouse came running out of the forest to find Ninja Fox. Was the Ninja Bread Man gone? For away, in another hidden dojo, a little old sensei worked under the mystical moon, mixing, rolling, shaping a Ninja Bread Man. The end. I had a wiggly tooth. It had been wiggling for days. I wiggled my tooth at breakfast, and I wiggled it at lunch. At snack time, I saw that Peter was eating a chocolate-licious cookie. I grabbed it and took a big bite. Look, my tooth came out. Yay, I said, but something was wrong. Oh no, mommy, it wasn't just Denny tooth, it was my sweet tooth. This cookie has no flavor, it tastes like dirt. Oh dear, you lost your sweet tooth, asked mommy. How dreadful, said daddy. It's what you get for stealing my cookies, said Peter sniffling. What am I gonna do without my sweet tooth? I know. I grabbed my pink-tastic pen and started to write. Dear Toothberry, today my sweet tooth came out. What should I do? Could you please send me something sweet to eat until a new tooth grows in? Love. Pinkalicious. I tucked the note under my pillow with my tooth and kept one eye open all night. I had always wanted to know exactly what the tooth fairy looks like. Tonight, I would see her. 
Bing, 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 quit my alarm. I must have fallen asleep. I looked for my tooth, but it was gone. In its place were three red candy hearts and a note. Dearest Pinkalicious, how art thou? Toothalina, your personal tooth fairy, was busy last night. Unfortunately, a girl in New Zealand was having her molars out. Toothalina had to fly there to help her. It takes a long time for a tooth fairy to fly because her wings are so small. Toothalina asked me to help you. I hope you don't mind. Forever yours, Carlos Cupid. Peter, come quick, I shouted. Cupid was here. Did you see him? Did you? Did you ask Peter? No, I missed him. I guess I fell asleep. Look, he left me candy. I put a couple of red hearts in my mouth. Eek! Those are red hearts. My mouth is burning. I yelled. They taste like coal. Yum, they taste great to me, said Peter. And look at all the hearts in your room. Cupid must really like you. Cupid loves everybody. Where is my tooth fairy? I want my tooth fairy, I said, stomping my foot. My plan was to stay awake all night long so I could take a picture of Cupid to show my class. I had my camera ready. I wrote another note. Dear Carlos Cupid, thank you so much for the red hots. Unfortunately, they were disgusting. I would prefer to have something sweet. Love, Pinkalicious. Pink, 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 went my alarm. I had fallen asleep again. I looked for my note. It was gone. In its place were three jelly beans and a new note. Dear Pinkalicious, excuse me. That candy wasn't sweet enough for you. Poor Carlos Cupid, his heart was broken last night when he read your letter saying that you didn't like his candy. He asked me to help you. Normally at this time of year, I am on an extravagant vacation in exciting Ecuador, but I decided perhaps I might be able to help you. Please enjoy the jelly beans. Kind regards, Edgar Easter Bunny. To P.S. Tutalina is in India helping an elephant with a tusk ache. When I tasted the jelly beans, they felt like little pebbles in my mouth. Yuck! I said, spitting them out. These jelly beans taste awful, and look at the footprints the bunny left around my room, I complained. I didn't see anything wrong with that at all, said Peter. Looks like he left eggs everywhere. He grabbed a basket and started to collect as many as he could. Where is Toothatina, I wondered. That night, I wrote another note. I had my camera ready, plus a net so I could catch that bunny if he had the nerve to hop around my room again. I would definitely stay awake tonight. Dear Edgar Easter Bunny, thank you so much for the eggs. Unfortunately, I lost my sweet tooth, so the jelly beans had no flavor. Could you please, please, please ask Tutatina to come and leave me something sweet? Love, Pinkalicious. Pink, 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 went my alarm. I fell asleep again. This time, I found three tiny candy canes and a note. Dear Pinkalicious, I am so happy that I got a break from all the toys. I have to make morning, noon, and night. Being a tooth fairy is a much better job. Tooth Tina had to fly to Japan to create celebrate with a little boy who is finally getting his braces off. She asked her to help out. Have a very merry day. Oh, number 351. I like the candy game. Gross! It tasted just like hard toothpaste. What a mess. There was snow everywhere. Do you think he left some toys here too, asked Peter? You sure are lucky. When I lose a tooth, I just get a few coins under my pillow. But I wanted something sweet for the tooth fairy. Something that would taste good until my new sweet tooth grows in. I want tooth that Tina. That night, I was ready. Dear elf number 351. <laughs> that night, I was ready. Dear elf number 351. Thank you so much for the candy canes. Unfortunately, they tasted bad. Could you please, 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 with sugar plum flavor on top, ask Toothatina to come and leave me something sweet. Perhaps she's the only one who could help me out. Pinkalicious Pinkerton. Pink, 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 went my alarm. I slept right through it. When I finally woke up, I found nothing. My note was gone, but there was nothing else. I was so disappointed. Nothing from Cupid, the Easter Bunny, or even elf number 351. Then, I noticed a teeny 
teeny-weeny slip of paper under my chair and three silver coins. Dear Pinkalicious, sweetness comes from the inside. When you are sweet, the world and all the delicious things in it will be sweet too. With love, to the Tina. P.S. Don't forget to brush and floss after every meal. Huh? What does that mean? I wondered. Hadn't I been sweet? Hmm. Maybe I wasn't sweet when I bent to Peter's chocolate cookie, or stomped my feet or spit out the candy. Maybe I could have been sweeter to Cupid, the Easter Bunny, and Elf number 351. I was really lucky that they came and visited me. I wrote a note. Dear Edgar Easter Bunny, Carlos Cupid, Elf number 351, and Tutatina. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to visit me and for leaving me Red Hots, Jelly Beans, Candy Gains, and three silver coins. I am sorry if I wasn't grateful. You made my room look very beautiful and you are welcome to visit me anytime. P.S. I want you to come back soon, Peter. Love, Pinkalicious. I folded it up for later. I began to feel much better. Hey, Pinkalicious, did you know that silver coins are actually made of chocolate? Asked Peter, stealing the coins out of my hand and running around the room. Peter, you can have the chocolates because you are usually such a nice brother, I said sweetly. Huh? Mm, I don't want them. You can have them back. I'm sorry I took them, Peter said, handing them back to me. How about if we share, I said, tasting a chocolate coin. Yummy! It's silverlicious! I can taste sweet things again. Hooray! From now on, I am always going to be as sweet as my sweet tooth. The end. My egg is emerald green. It lies like a jewel in this dry red land. I will hatch with wings and feathers, but I will never fly. Who am I? Whose egg? I am an emu. I will grow tall. One day I will run swiftly over the red desert sands. My egg is tough and leathery. I call to my mother from a warm, earthly nest. I will hatch with yellow stripes and needle-sharp teeth. I have scaly claws and snapping jaws. Who am I? Whose egg? I am an alligator. I will grow big and strong. I will swim in swampy waters. I will lie low and lazy in the hot sun. My egg lies high and dry on a nest of silver stones. I will hatch with fuzzy feathers. One day, I'll wear a suit. Who am I? Whose egg? I am a penguin. I will waddle, hop, and belly flop across the ice and snow. I will jump into the water with a splish, splosh, splash. My egg is creamy white, it sticks to white green leaves. I will wiggle and crawl when I hatch, but one day I will fly in the sky. Who am I? Whose egg? I am a butterfly. I wave my bright wings in the sun to dry. I will flap and fly and flutter by. My egg lies warm and dry in a riverbank burrow. I hatch from an egg, but I have a fur coat and I drink my mother's milk. Who am I? Whose egg? I am a platypus. I breathe air through my duck-filled snout. I use my webbed feet to dip and dive in the water. My egg lies on a mossy mound. I will hatch hungry. I will slither and slide to hunt for food. Who am I? Whose egg? I am a snake. My scales are all different kinds of colors. I may strike or squeeze and swallow. Hiss. My egg is buried in warm golden sand. I will hatch with scaly flippers in a smooth shell. I will scuttle and scoot toward the shining sea. Who am I? Whose egg? I am a turtle. I will swim far across the wide, wavy ocean. I will sunbathe on the sandy shores. My egg is a speckled globe. It lies like a treasure among scattered shells. I will hatch with fluffy feathers. 
and a peeping, piping call. Who am I? Who's egg? I am a plover. I will run stops and starts on my long yellow legs. One day, I will lay my own polka dotted eggs. The end. I don't know what to do today. You can't think of anything? I can think of lots of things, but I don't want to do any of them. Want to go for a swim? To what? Play? With what? What's Pig doing? Probably something boring. Then clean your room. I just did. I'll go see if my friends have any better ideas. Rabbit, what should we do today? Hop around in circles and then start. I don't know what to do today. You can't think of anything? I can think of lots of things, but I don't want to do any of them. Want to go for a swim? To what? Play? With what? What's Pig doing? Probably something boring. Then clean your room. I just did. I'll go see if my friends have any better ideas. Rabbit, what should we do today? Hop around in circles and then stare off into space like this. This is even less fun than it looks. Cat, there's just nothing to do. Well then, you should nick between your toes for a while. Ew. If you know a better way to clean between your toes, I'd like to hear about it. I don't know what to do. Do you have any ideas? Sure. First on a nice spot. And sleep until it's dark. And wake up. And that's it. Who wants to spend the whole day sleeping? I do. Good night. Pig, I can't find anything to do. Have you tried sniffing around the dirt? Why would I do that? If you have to ask, I can't explain it to you. I know, let's take a look at my trusty list. Pig's fantastic list of things to do when he doesn't know what to do. Continued. Build model Eiffel Tower. Two, hump for three hours without stopping once. Three, stare at the wall. Four, try not to think about squirrels or their fluffy tails. Five, wake out. Six, spin around until dizzy. <laughs> Pig, I'm not sure this list qualifies as fantastic. What's the matter? Today is almost over and I didn't do anything. Why do you have to do anything? Just be. Watch clouds go by. Think about stuff. Then put do nothing on your to-do list and check it off. Sometimes the best ideas come when you stop looking for them. Really? Let's try it. Take a deep breath. Empty your mind. Oh, it's empty. Be one with the universe. One with the universe, check. Now wait. Wonderful, glad I could help. Sit with me for a minute. So what did you do all day? Nothing, and you know what? It was great. I came up with the best idea of what to do tomorrow. You have school tomorrow. Oh, I can't go to school. I've got nothing to do. <laughs> the end. It was a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Daniel was drawing some funny faces, but his hair kept falling into his eyes. 
Grr, stay up there, hare, said Daniel. Hmm, said Dad Tiger. Your hair has grown longer. Daniel was confused. He hadn't felt his hair grow. Growing happens even when you don't feel it, said Dad Tiger. Daniel didn't like his hair in his eyes. And that means it's time for your first haircut, said Dad Tiger. Daniel had never had a haircut before. Dad sang, when we do something new, let's talk about what we'll do. Let's talk about your haircut, said Dad. What's a haircut like, asked Daniel. Dad explained that when you get a haircut, a hairdresser or barber gently holds your hair and then cuts the ends with scissors. Hey, said Daniel, that looks good. Then let's go get your haircut, said Dad. They headed to, up to the salon. Daniel was excited to get his hair cut, but a little nervous too. Who would cut his hair? Daniel was so happy to see Nana Platypus. She was cutting Prince Tuesday's hair. I didn't know you cut hair, said Daniel. I sure do, said Nana. Snip, snip, snip. Nana used her special scissors to cut Prince Tuesday's hair. Does your haircut hurt, Prince Tuesday? asked Daniel. Prince Tuesday told Daniel that it doesn't hurt at all. Nana's blow dryer made a worrying noise as she dried Prince Tuesday's hair. Soon, Prince Tuesday's haircut was over and his hair was a little shorter. It looks terrific, said Daniel. Thanks, little Dee, said Prince Tuesday. See you later. After Prince Tuesday le left, Miss Eliana and Lady Elaine entered the salon. Miss Eliana was excited. Nana Platypus was going to braid her hair today. Who wants to go first, asked Nana. Daniel wasn't ready for his haircut yet. Miss Eliana couldn't wait for her braid, so she got into the special chair first. When we do something new, let's talk about what we'll do, Nana sang. Nana told Miss Eliana what she was going to do. I'm going to lift my chair up, up, up. Next, Nana put a cape on Miss Eliana. Nana told her that the cape would keep her clothes clean and dry while she styled her hair. Miss Eliana felt like a superhero with a backward cape. Now, it's time to sit still, said Nana. Miss Eliana sat very still. Nana Platypus brushed out her hair before she started braiding it. Nana braided Miss Eliana's hair and put colorful berets in it at the bottom of each one. The berets made a clickety clackety sound when they bounced together. Snip, snip, snip. Whirr, 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 clickety clack. There's so many sounds at the hair salon. Daniel imagined what getting a haircut would be like if everything in the hair salon made music. Brush, brush, the brush your hair, spray, spray everywhere. Let's wash, wash, wash your hair, snip, snip, you're almost there. When your hair gets too long on top, let's head down to the barber shop. All done, said Nana Platypus. Look at my boomerific braids, said Miss Eliana. I love them. Daniel liked them too. Now it's time for your haircut, Daniel, said Nana Platypus. But Daniel didn't know if he was ready for his haircut. Nana sang, when we do something new, let's talk about what we'll do. Come sit in my chair, said Nana. Nana told Daniel what she was going to do. First, you'll go up, up, up. Whee, said Daniel. Then she put a cape on Daniel, just as she had done on Miss Eliana. Now, I'll spray your hair with water, said Nana. What is that for, I wonder, Daniel? Sometimes I spray water on hair so it's easier to cut, said Nana. Spray, spray, spray. It felt cool and a little wet. Daniel was ready for Nana to cut his hair. Okay, said Nana, now it's time for you to sit still. Daniel sat as still as he could. Nana's scissors went snip, snip, snip. Hey, that doesn't hurt at all, said Daniel. All done, said Nana. Daniel's hair wasn't in his eyes anymore. I like my haircut. Thank you, Nana, said Daniel. You're very welcome, she replied. Everyone liked Daniel's new haircut. Dad Tiger even took a picture. Daniel was a little nervous about his first haircut, but when he talked about what he'd do, he felt better. And you can too, neighbor. Ugga mugga.
The end. Tonight, when I left under the bed for my monster, I found this note instead. Gone fishing. Back in a week. Gabe. What was I going to do? I needed a monster under my bed. How was I supposed to get to sleep if my monster was gone? I tried to sleep, but it wasn't the same without Gabe. I missed his ragged breathing, his nose whistling, the scrabbling of his uncut claws. How would I ever get to sleep without Gabe's familiar scary noises and his spooky green ooze? It was no use. Gabe would be gone for a week and I just had to have a monster. I climbed quietly out of bed so my parents wouldn't hear me. Grown-ups have some strange ideas about monsters under beds. I knocked on the floorboards, then scrambled back under my covers. I waited nervously. Would a new monster appear? What would he be like? Would his snorting be as cheerful as Gabe's? When I heard some creaking under my bed, I knew that the substitute monster had arrived. Good evening, said a low, breathy voice. My name is Herbert, and I will be your monster for the evening. Herbert, what kind of name is that for a monster? You don't sound scared at all. Have you ever scared a kid before? Well, no, but I have read all the best books on the topic. Do you have long teeth and scratchy claws, I asked. No, but I have an overbite, and I'm a mouth breather. Listen. <sighs> Herbert's panting was kind of scary, but it wasn't enough for me. Listen, Herbert, I'm sorry. I just don't think this is going to work. It's nothing personal, but I really need a monster with claws. Picky. Picky, Herbert complained. As you wish, I'll go. And there was some more creaking. Then Herbert was gone. Some scratching warned me that a second monster had appeared. Good evening, he said in a high, silky voice. My name is Ralph. I understand you need a monster with claws. If you would please lean over, I will hold out an arm for inspection. I crouched the edge of the bed, hoping to see a horrible shaggy arm with sharp, ragged nails. Instead, I was surprised to see a sleekly brushed fur with smooth, shiny claws. Excuse me, I don't mean to be rude, I asked, but is that nail polish on your claws? Yes, it is, Ralph replied. I believe professional monsters should always be well groomed. I could tell this was not going to work either. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Ralph, but I need a monster with scary claws, like Gabe's, I thought. I heard some more scratching, and I knew Ralph was gone. A minute later, a third voice came from under the bed and rasped, Check out these claws, kid. I gathered my courage and peered over the edge. The claws were impressive, jagged and dark and razor sharp. So far, so good. I was a little nervous. Could you stick out your tail, I whispered. Sure, but don't get scared. I peeked through my fingers at the slimy tail slithering over the foot of my bed. That's when I noticed the bow. Are you a Girl monster? Of course I am, she snapped. I'm Cynthia. Do you have a problem with that? Uh, yeah, I do, I admitted. I definitely need a boy monster. Boy monsters are for boys, and girl monsters are for girls. Everybody knows that. Well, aren't you a picky one, she sniffed, and then she was gone. Was I being too picky? No. I knew that my monster needed to be well clawed and menacing. The whole point of having a monster, after all, was to keep me in bed, imagining all the scary stuff that could happen if I got out. 
Then, I heard a shuffling noise and some slobbering. A fourth monster was under my bed. Hey, the name's Mac. One look at his claws proved that Mac was a big, scruffy boy monster. I shivered. Maybe this one will work out. Those are excellent claws, but do you have a long tail? I leaned over to see. No, my tail's stumpy, Max slurped, but I do have an unusually long tongue. Why would I be afraid of a long tongue, I asked. Oh, I don't know, he said, trying to sound terrifying. You never know when I might lick you. And I fell back to the bed laughing. Well, if you're not even gonna try to work with me, Mac whined. I held in my giggles. I really don't think you should send me away, he warned. Kids who reject five monsters in one night. I did not reject five monsters tonight, I interrupted. My regular monster went fishing. Fishing, eh? Maybe you just left because you're so picky. Fine, I'm out of here. But I wouldn't expect another monster tonight if I were you. How was I ever gonna get to sleep without my monster? I was surprised to hear more creaking under bed. Loud creaking, but scratching. I thought no more monsters were gonna appear tonight, I said. Sorry, I'm late, kid. Phew, it was Gabe. I thought I would enjoy fishing, but I didn't, he explained. Those fish scare too easily, no challenge at all. You, however, are challenging, my friend. You're almost too old to be afraid of monsters. You keep me on my toes. Ah, toes, a delicious snack. The bed quivered as Gabe's stomach rumbled with hunger. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to start the evening with an ominous puddle of drool. I peeked over the edge of the bed. Green ooze spread soundlessly from underneath. Then, the bed trembled as Gabe unfurled his spiked tail. He was daring me to guess where he might pop up. I shivered. So you had some substitute monsters tonight, Gabe said, sharpening his claws on my bedpost. Were you scared? Then Gabe started tapping. I could tell he wanted to know if I still needed him. No other monster can scare me like you, I giggled, diving under my covers and pulling them up tight. Through the blanket, I heard Gabe's soft, comforting snorts. Ha, I knew it. We're made for each other, he growled. When blanket started to slip off the bed, I knew Gabe was ready to eat. Now, if you could please stick out your foot, he said, I'd like to nibble your pinky. I yanked my blanket up and scrunched my feet so Gabe couldn't get them. No toast tonight. You can have this, I offered, pushing the pillow off the bed. And even here, it hit the floor. Gabe was back. The ooze was perfect. Everything was back to normal. I shivered again. I'd be asleep in no time. The end. One Foggy Groggy Morning by the Salty Splashy Sea. I'm sure I saw a dinosaur, and I'm sure that he saw me. I ran and told the fisherman, who ran and told his mom, who ran and told the butcher, he must hurry up and come. The butcher told the baker, and the baker told the vet, and they ran down to the seashore with a camera and a net. What's the matter, asked the priest. Now what is all this fuss? A dinosaur's been seen, they said. We're sure it can see us. The priest told all the people, and each person told a friend. They all came running down the beach to Sandy Bottom End. All the aunts and uncles came, the nephews and the nieces. All the grands and granddads came, and Wooly had some felices. The king with sweets and sandwiches and a soup inside a flask. Some didn't know why they were there, but didn't want to ask. The newsman came on, the navy came. The captain called his crew. A dinosaur's been seen, he said. Make sure it can't see you. 
They came with ropes and motorboats, with cannons and with snares. They came with swords and submarines and scientists and prayers. The Air Force came, the Army came and formed a human chain. Men in parachutes arrived and jumped out of a plane. They came with dogs and divers and monoculars and bait and searched the sea for dinosaurs from morning until late. They sat on the wind and snow, they sat on in the rain, and none of them showed any sign of going home again. They set up camp around the sand and tents and trucks and cars, and still they sat and watched and wait beneath the moon and stars. But will they see a dinosaur? Or was it my master plan to help my daddy sell ice cream? He is the ice cream man. No one comes to buy them in the winter when it's cold. Now everybody wants one. Every frozen treat's been sold. I'm sure I saw a dinosaur, but is it really true? Come and buy an ice cream. And perhaps you'll see one too. <laughs> the end.